Welcome back. Now, I had intended to bring HP Lovecraft Month back for October. However, due to YouTube problems, I've had to push that back. But any time of the year can be HP Lovecraft Month. But I did need a review for Halloween. So I thought, why not look at my quintessential childhood Halloween movie? And it's bizarrely a family Disney film about child murder. This is Hocus Pocus. Depicted as a story, we enter the film via a book, achieving the fairy tale feel the film is going for, helped even more by a witch flying about. And in the small town of Salem, the witch flies past the window of Thackeray Binks, waking him up concerned for his sister. Emily? Emily? No offence to the guy, but I always thought the actor playing Thackeray had the kind of acting for radio. But rather interestingly, I found out that the actor, Sean Murray, didn't provide his voice at all. He was dubbed over, rather convincingly, by Jason Marsden, who's had quite the successful career in animation and video games. But why didn't they just use Marsden the whole film? He's done live action before. It would have saved a lot of time and money on unnecessary ADR work. Back to the film, we hear singing of a Pied Piper variety as Thackeray asks his neighbour where his sister is. He doesn't know, but tells Thackeray that the witches are brewing evil in the woods. So that's where they're going next, as they see Emily run in. She's done for. Well, that's a pretty defeatist attitude, don't you think? Maybe these child-snatching witches who live right next to your village wouldn't be such a problem if people grew some actual balls and not just take action after the whole child murder thing. Thackeray sends his neighbour to rally the others and runs off alone, but makes it to the witch's cottage in good time. Well, actually, even though Emily was kidnapped in the morning, it's apparently taken Thackeray and the witch all day to arrive, as it's now evening. Yeah, good luck on getting those townspeople there anytime soon. In the cottage, we finally meet the witches who are dancing around Emily creepily, and Winifred is introduced with this line. Oh, look. Another glorious morning. Makes me sick! Which for main antagonists who are very, very evil, the witches are also some of the best comedy in the film. It's a strange disconnection, cause Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker and Kathy Najimy all get top billing, but the other actors aren't even mentioned on the DVD. So for a Disney film, it's strangely marketed like a franchise horror film, with the antagonist as the focus whose personality drives the plot of the movie. Winifred wakes up her spell book that actually has a working eye and bound in human skin. Aha! That's the Necronomicon. We're good. This is HP Lovecraft month worthy. Lovecraft had witches. The dreams in the witch house practically had the same plot. And equally evil witch. So I'm counting it. Anyway, the witches brew a potion to make themselves younger, with Sarah and Mary set up as, quite frankly, the idiots of the group, throwing toes at each other. And after adding a bit of their own tongue, gross, they attempt to get Emily to drink the potion. But Thackeray jumps down to stop them and pours it away. However, Winifred gets all Emperor on his ass and Force Lightnings him. And then... <sighs> Sisters, prepare thyselves. Tis her life force. The potion works. Why the fuck did she drink it? She wasn't under any kind of trance because of the way she reacted when she saw Thackeray. My only conclusion is she's an idiot. Simple as that. So the witches proceed to suck the life out of Emily and then marvel at their rejuvenated state. Also, the music gets remarkably upbeat considering there's a dead child sitting right there. Thackeray pulls himself up to insult the witches, calling them ugly, which strikes a nerve. So they decide to curse Thackeray using the Necronomicon to make him immortal and now a cat, showing why he was voiced by a voice actor. And at last, the village people show up. Young man, there's no need to build down. I said, young man. 
No, it's the angry mob variety. But at least the witches are good at keeping a low profile. We are just three kindly old spitzer ladies. Uh, spending a quiet evening at home. Sucking the lives of little children. <laughs> you know, I think the witch's incompetence says way more about the villagers they're victimising than the witches themselves. The witches are sentenced to be hanged, which they accept quite well considering. However, the sisters sing to unnerve the mob, causing one of them to drop Winifred's book. And it opens to a spell that says they'll be resurrected by a virgin on Halloween when there's a full moon. And then they get hanged. Full moon on Halloween sounds pretty normal, but it's actually an incredibly rare occurrence. The last one being in 1974, not the time this film is set. And the next one will be in 2020. So not much cause for celebration from the witches. They're going to be dead a really long time. We then jump ahead to a 90s classroom as the teacher tells the story of the witches, but our main character, Max, isn't impressed at all, and thoroughly criticised for his scepticism. But everyone here knows that Halloween was invented by the candy companies. When he should be criticised for his idiotic theories. One of his classmates, Alison, rightfully corrects him and that prompts Max into a rather ham-fisted approach into asking her out. But she just returns his number to him outside. Also, slight nitpick here, but this takes place in 1993 and Halloween was on a Sunday that year, so not sure why they were in school. Max cycles home, which is when we're introduced to Salem's sorry excuse for bullies, Jay and Ernie. How many times I gotta tell you, my name ain't Ernie no more, it's Ice. Yeah, they're complete idiots. But despite that, the film tries to make them as intimidating as possible. Whoa! Check out the new cross trainers. Let me try them on. <laughs> See, now why did those guys get an ominous musical score when the child-murdering witches are treated like clowns? I'll stop talking about it. But it really is a weird disconnection for me. Max gets home after losing his shoes to spoon with a pillow, getting quickly interrupted by his little sister Danny. And I'm glad she did, cause God knows what he would be getting up to with her in the closet. Danny persuades Max into taking her trick or treating in the best way a child can. <coughs> Which is a trait of annoying child characters. However, Danny never really strays into the stereotype. She acts like a person and isn't just a token child for the movie to use as peril bait. She has a personality, and she's both realistic, but also entertaining. Danny is trick-or-treating while Max is completely miserable, so of course the bullies from earlier show up to be complete dicks, for no real reason, demanding candy from Danny. And after the customary insults, Max hands over a bag. Now, at first, the bullies seem to be in the film, because the main character is in high school and that's the expected trope. But that's only half right. The film differs it slightly because they have zero impact on the plot. They just exist in this world without any kind of specific statement around them, which in my opinion is more real. After the episode with the bullies, Max takes his frustrations out on Danny, which obviously has her crying. But because these two are actually written pretty well, Max has a heart to heart, apologising for his attitude as they continue trick or treating, finding basically a mansion, and inside it turns out to be Alison's house, with her parents throwing a party straight out of a Disney animation. In fact, hang on. Alison is rich and throws lavish parties, and will actually do most of the rescuing and forward thinking of the film. Whereas Max is the innocent virgin who wants a better life for himself and will incur the wrath of evil witches. So, Max is a Disney princess and Alison is the Prince Charming. And yet, he's not a token to be passed around, so well played, Disney. Well played. However, Danny, still being a child, they have to get a kids say the funniest things moment when she comments on Alison's dress. I couldn't wear anything like that because I don't have any... What do you call them, Max? Yabos? <laughs> <laughs> Which is surprisingly mature for such a young girl. Danny mentions how she was told about the witches and Alison just so happens to have access to the witch's home, now a museum. So Max takes the suggestion to check out the place with Danny not wanting to go. Danny, this is the girl of my dreams. Yeah, he's a teenage boy. That really doesn't mean much at that age. But Danny does make a deal. Next year we go trick-or-treating as Wendy and Peter Pan with tights or it's no deal. Okay, okay, deal, deal. 
deal. I have to wonder after the film's events if Danny still held him to that. Because then he'd have two horrible Halloweens in a row. It's up to you which one's worse. So then all three of them get to the house, which must mean the town of Salem has gotten fucking huge if they got there before dawn. Inside the house, it's practically condemned and dark. Found a lighter. That lighter for some reason has fuel in it? Now, I know Zippos are pretty good, but they don't come with fuel. Shit, Zippos need to give Disney advertising revenue. And while looking around, Max spots a candle, the Black Flame candle, mentioned in Winifred's prophecy, which he wants to light. A black cat suddenly jumps in from behind, but that doesn't stop Max from making a very bad decision. Oh, come on, it's just a bunch of hocus pocus. Max, no! <laughs> Uh -oh. Now, obviously the witch is going to get resurrected, but I have to wonder just how likely did the witches think their lives would end if they specifically made a candle that was designed to resurrect them in these circumstances. After all, Winifred was surprised as anyone when the book showed her the resurrection spell. I'm sensing a glass half empty kind of attitude here. So the place lights up in green and rumbles and shakes, but then is silent. What happened? A virgin. Lit the candle. How does she know what a virgin is? I don't know, maybe that says more about me than her, but did she have to spit out the word like it was some kind of insult? Something suddenly destroys all the bulbs in the place, which somehow turn into candles, and then the witches appear, with everyone quickly hiding. Winifred asks the important question of who lit the candle, waking up the Necronomicon, and that's when Mary tells her she can smell children which is her particular witch power. Yeah, the witches have specific powers unique to them. Mary has the smelling children's thing, which is pretty weird. Sarah lures them with her singing, and Winifred is the spellcaster. But they don't have a tank or healer. How do they expect to get anywhere without a full party? Mary starts searching for children, sensing Danny under the counter as they spook her out of the hiding place. I thought that would never come, sisters. <laughs> Greetings, little one. It was I who brought you back. Imagine. You know, that's actually a pretty good plan. Make the witches think they were brought back by another witch. After all, we don't know how well the rejuvenation spell works. They could think she's hundreds of years old in a child's body. But no, that charade is completely forgotten about when Mary gets even a little bit threatening to Danny, which is pretty disappointing. And when the witches try to stick Danny in the cauldron, I guess they actually eat children as well as suck the life out of them, and that doesn't make them any less despicable. Max confronts the witches, telling them to put Danny down. I wonder how well that goes. <laughs> yeah, it's deja vu all over again. Winifred lifts Max into the ceiling, but that's when Prince Charming springs into action, hitting Mary with a broom, and Danny then saves Max, with the cat also attacking Winifred. You see? Max is the damsel in distress here which is actually a pretty clever bit of juxtaposition. He's shown to be the hero, he even acts like the hero, and he does have a few heroic moments. But it's still Allison and Danny who do the real saving. And speaking of Max's heroics, he climbs into the rafters and threatens to summon the burning rain of death on the witches, which is just him setting off the sprinkler system. But it's enough to freak them out. But Max's heroics are still undermined by him falling on his ass. This is when the black cat is revealed to be Thackeray Binks, who can talk, conveniently, telling Max to take the Necronomicon before getting the hell out of there. But after an embarrassingly long time, Winifred finally realises it's just water, so maybe now they'll be a little bit more intelligent. Oh, this is a black river. Oh god, these are long dead fish out of water, aren't they? And that's going to be a large portion of the comedy here, which still makes me wonder why the child murderers are also the comic relief. It's pretty weird. I do like how they deal with the situation. <laughs> yeah, Sarah is pretty much treated horribly and like the complete idiot. She actually is throughout, for again, more comic relief. Our heroes, and Max, are led to a cemetery by Binks the cat because it's hollow ground and the witches can't set foot there. Wait a second, what reason did Binks have to remain silent for 300 years? If he spoke, that would confirm the witches were real and then more people would be determined to keep the witches dead. 
And why the hell was the Black Flame candle unprotected? We've seen that many people of the town believe the story. Once in the graveyard, Bink shows them the grave of William Butcherson, who was Winifred's lover until he was found cheating on her with Sarah. So she poisoned him and sewed his mouth shut. Which is again pretty damn evil. Why is horrible, brutal murder in this film not given the adequate horror it deserves from the characters? Back at the house, Winifred is having to explain multiple times that if they don't use the rejuvenation potion before dawn, they'll die again. She eventually gets them to understand, though. Dost thou comprehend? Well, you explained it beautifully, Winnie. The way you said it started out with the adventure part and then you sort of slowly... Explain what? It's... <sighs> How were these witches so goddamn feared? And how did it take so damn long for the villagers to kill them? Binks shows them Emily's grave, reaffirming his mission to stop the witches, but he has to quickly stop Alison from opening the Necronomicon, telling her how dangerous it is. So Max decides to burn the book, but obviously it's not that simple. But it doesn't really matter as the witches appear soon after. <laughs> it's just a bunch of hocus pocus! How did she know he said that? She was dead. I doubt she has some kind of perception of the mortal realm because she didn't know what a goddamn road was. The witches attack with Alison saving Max, again, from Sarah. And Winifred calls to the book to come to her, but Binks quickly stops that. So more flying around ensues until Binks mentions a problem. They can't touch us here, right? Well, they can't. You just had to say that, didn't you? So yeah, Winifred gets the idea to resurrect good old William Butcherson, but I don't think he's as pleased to be alive as the sisters. I really like the character of Billy the Zombie, because he's resurrected by Winifred, but he still hates her and doesn't really care about what she wants him to do. He's already dead, not much else can happen to him. He has a great... <sighs> attitude about everything that I can really relate to, you know? Also, he's played by the great Doug Jones, one of the few actors who only improve their performance under a crap load of makeup. Binks leads everyone to an opening with Max knocking off Billy's head. But don't worry, that's not going to stop him, as he has to scramble for it, while Winifred is beyond annoyed with him. Which again, Billy doesn't give a shit about. Seriously, he's great. And outside the cemetery, there's a pretty ridiculous but funny scene of Mary having to calm Winifred down with a calming circle before they get startled by a bus, and enjoy the pretty lecherous bus driver. Well, then suit. We desire... Children. <laughs> hey, that may take me a couple of tries, but I don't think that'd be a problem. I'll find out. Ugh. Binks finds a way out of the sewers via a manhole. However, the bus driver has, for some reason, allowed Sarah to drive, which results in... Now, that was pretty gruesome, surprisingly so, but animals have a strong likeliness of, shall we say, exploding under the wheels of a bus, so it could have been a lot worse. But Binks is yet another character capable of resurrection, as his body inflates, and then he's back to normal, which again would have been a lot worse if he had to put himself together again like a gory T-1000. And back on the bus, Mary quickly brings it to a full stop, telling Winifred she can smell children. But outside, they're thoroughly confused by all the costumes, thinking they're hobgoblins. With this pretty funny moment. Bless you. <laughs> Which is probably the scariest that costume will ever get. Mary's pretty hysterical that she's lost her ability, which is a running thing with her. Which, come to think of it, the reason why she's so hysterical is that if she lost her ability to locate children, Winifred would no longer have a use for her. It's an interesting insight into the minds of the sisters. And then some guy dressed up like the devil makes an appearance, who the sisters believe him to be the real Satan, as he invites them inside for an overly long and pretty pointless one-joke scene. But before that, the others have found a motorcycle cop and quickly explained to him what just happened. But his only real question is... Are you a virgin? Yeah. Ugh, such a bizarre fixation for a Disney film. However, the cop tells them to get out of there thinking it's a prank, but it doesn't really matter anyway. I just a bunch of kids pulling my chain. I thought I was a real cop. <laughs> hey, douchebag. Impersonating an officer like that with an accurate vehicle and uniform is pretty damn illegal and would get you an immediate prison sentence. So I wouldn't be so smug if I were you. 
Back with Budget Satan, he's showing them around the place and introducing his give-no-fucks wife. But unfortunately for the witches, outside the child versions of them are committing Grand Theft Broom, which will be interesting when they figure out how they work. But the joke must go on, unfortunately, as the witches mess around with Budget Satan, with Winifred thinking the kitchen is a torture chamber, Mary loving the TV, and Sarah indulging in her usual seductive ways. It all just goes on a bit too long for me. It doesn't add anything to the film. And it's just the same fish out of water joke, just in different variations. We're not exactly wanting for those. Mercifully, Budget Satan's wife kicks the witches out. Well, she tries, but they're not inclined to leave. Take your clock bars and get out of my house! Make us... Okay, maybe the witches are going to start acting more like villains now. Is it too much to ask for a bit of threat from the villains of the movie? Seriously? And outside they find their brooms missing, and Winifred is the voice of reason, explaining that the children are in costumes, leading to actually my favourite moment. All Hallows Eve has become a night of frolic. Oh. Where children wear costumes and run amok. Oh. Amok! Amok, 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 amok! It's so mean and brutal. I just love how vicious it is. Returning to the others, they've gone to where the party's at to find their parents. And this party does have a kick-ass skeleton band that I can't let you hear due to copyright. Max and Allison find his dad and try to tell him what's happened, and Danny finds her mother, trying to tell her that Binks can talk, which he seems to be pretty quiet about, leading Danny's mother to think she's gone mental. Still not sure why Binks wouldn't talk. That would prove everything they're saying, and potentially rally the entire town against the witches. But then the sisters show up at the party and Max gets on the stage taking the mic cause warning people about the witches has gone so well so far. However, when all eyes are on them, Winifred quite cleverly turns the situation around to make it seem like it was intentional and starts probably the most well-known part of the film. As Winifred starts to sing her version of I Put a Spell on You, which again, I can't show you because copyright hates the world. But I will say that Bette Midler can really sing a belter here, and it's a great version. And I do want to question how the sisters know what a microphone is, but the song's too good to care about a minor detail. The others try telling their parents that it's some kind of spell and not to listen, but at this point it's all just wasted energy, as Billy shows up to chase them out of the building, and Winifred finishes the song, which will cause all the people to dance to death. Everyone runs into an alley with Max pretty angry that the witches have the upper hand, telling Alison to take Danny. But then the witches show up looking for them. But fortunately, the smell of the lobster restaurant throws off the scent from Mary, and they move on. While getting up, Alison accidentally opens an old oven, giving her an idea as we move to the high school where the witches are. It's never actually explained how or why the witches go to the school. You could argue they're drawn to the book, but that's never actually mentioned. They show up there because of plot convenience, unfortunately. Inside, Max uses the intercom to confuse the sisters, even though they knew the concept of a microphone before, but whatever. The witches hear a voice coming from one of the rooms and follow it to a stereo playing a tape, which is when the trap is sprung and the sisters are locked inside the kiln and cremated alive. Again, surprisingly goddamn brutal for a Disney film as we see the smoke of their charred corpses floating into the sky while everyone celebrates. They get home, but there's no one there, as we see they're still dancing, so something's not quite right. But everyone is contented in their victory as they sleep. However, that's when the witches return reformed, because victory isn't that easy. But the sisters do something pretty good when they encounter the bullies, being drawn to them because of Max's shoes. And then the bullies make a big mistake when they call the sisters ugly chicks. So they just lock them up, which is definitely a nice amount of karma. Winifred feels certain they won't get the book in time, so attempts to remember the rejuvenation potion. But after flailing about a bit, she can't remember, and calls out to the book, which actually gets the Necronomicon's attention as Alison and Max wake up. Alison needs to leave because it's 5am, but seeing Binks, she and Max think the book might have a spell to remove the curse, so they open it. Nothing weird so far. Nothing weird? Are they seeing the same thing I am? Because usually books don't burst with ethereal light when I open them. 
And as the book shines, Winifred sees it out the window and knows what it means. So off they fly to retrieve the book. Without brooms. So they have to improvise. With a mop and a modern broom. But Mary... Now, I haven't seen it myself, but apparently the latest DVD version of this film completely omits the improvised broom scene for some bizarre reason. It's a good joke, honestly. I've no idea why they would get rid of that. Alison finds out that a circle of salt can protect them from the witches, but Binks orders them to close the book, angrily explaining it does nothing good. In the kitchen, Alison gets her salt, just to calm her nerves, before they hear a noise upstairs and find the witches there waiting for them. Winifred uses the book to attack Max, and Alison circles herself in salt, forcing the witches to fly off with Danny. And while flying, Winifred gets Sarah to sing her Pied Piper song to draw all the children to them. And surprisingly, Sarah Jessica Parker actually sang the song in the film, which, apart from sounding pretty nice, also sounds pretty sinister in context. The sisters have brewed the potion and tied up Danny, making sure she'll be the first to try it. But she's not as stupid as Emily and refuses. Max then bursts in, telling them that he'll destroy them as the sun shines through the window, incapacitating the witches. Also, karma strikes again as Max takes his shoes back, leaving the douchebags in their cages. Also, obviously that wasn't the sun. So, I'm just annoyed that the witches somehow managed to fall for the exact same trick Max pulled when they first met. I mean, I know it's only been a few hours, but you'd think they'd learn something. Max pushes over the potion, destroying it, and escapes quickly, which is when the witches finally realise they've been tricked with a funny line from Winifred. Daddy! Oh, he's tricked us again! Oh, you're right, you're always right! I don't know how it's you my do. curse! That! And you too! Winifred finds she's only got enough potion for one child, so in classic Disney villain fashion, instead of using it on the numerous other children outside the cottage, she decides on revenge and use it on Danny which is the biggest boneheaded move of the entire film. Everyone is driving away when the witches show up on their brooms. <laughs> Hello there. Let me see a driver's permit. <laughs> How do you even know what a driver's permit is? They all arrive at the graveyard, the best and most logical place to go, but Billy shows up knocking Max to the ground. Max tries to fight Billy off with a pocket knife, and Winifred commands Billy to kill him and get Danny. But, like I said, Billy's got no fucks left to give, so he uses the knife to open his stitches. Don't! Donald, come along now! <laughs> Those were real moths, by the way, in Doug Jones's mouth. I tell you, that guy really commits to his roles. And then... Wench! <gasps> Trollop! You! Bucktooth! Mop rhyme! Firefly from <laughs> hell! <laughs> I've waited centuries to say that. I just love the incredibly pleased look he gets on his face when he gets to spout insults. It's great. Seriously, my favourite character. So Billy becomes an unlikely ally. He was only chasing the group of four to help them, as Max has to tell the others before they bash him to bits. Now it's time for the final stand, as Max gets a baseball bat and Allison circles Danny and Salt, just in time for the witch's arrival. Max swings, but Winifred just takes the bat and knocks him down. However, Allison is far more successful, throwing a handful of salt in Sarah's face. And then Billy loses his head again, so Danny leaves the circle to collect it. Another boneheaded move, as she's picked up by Winifred. But again, she's not an idiot, refusing to drink the potion, as Binks attacks, causing the vial to fall, and Binks is thrown away. And I gotta admit, this climax is pretty well done. There's an adequate amount of tension, because all they have to do is hold off the witches till dawn. But it still feels like a genuine battle, because everyone takes some kind of hit. And Max, being the Disney princess, makes the sacrifice for his sister and drinks the potion, giving Winifred no choice but to take him instead of Danny. Ooh, to give up thy life for thy sisters. That's an interesting line from Winifred. It kind of makes me think that maybe that's how she feels towards her own sisters, because she has been insulting and hitting them the entire night. Especially because Winifred has now taken Max for herself, but he retaliates while the others hold Mary back, keeping her from helping, causing her and Sarah to fly off into the sky. And as the sun rises, Winifred is knocked off her broom and tries to take Max's life. But it's too late, as she quickly turns to a statue, and Mary and Sarah both explode in the sun, before Winifred finally explodes as well.
Now, there's no confirmation of this, but the fact that Winifred turned to stone before exploding, it's reasonable to assume that that was because she was on hallowed ground, which I find is pretty unique and different. I would have liked to have seen more of that kind of stuff explored, really. Before the end, first we need to make sure Max is alright, although his life is significantly shortened, I'm sure, and Billy goes back to bed. <laughs> However, there's a problem, as Binks is well and truly dead, for real this time, as his ghost appears to them all, to comfort Danny, and he gets to be reunited with his sister as they get a big walk-off into the sunset. But wait, there's more, as the parents walk out of the party very, very sweaty, but we know they're alright, and the bullies are still in their cages. Good as we see that the Necronomicon is still alive and waiting to be placed in Miskatonic University's library. So that was Hocus Pocus, and despite my admittedly constant complaints throughout the film, I still find it an extremely enjoyable watch. And it does deserve to be a Halloween staple, if I'm honest. It's goofy, yet still funny. It's inconsistent with its bizarre tones, but still entertaining. And even though I find it strange that the witches get full prominence in all the film's marketing, they are the best characters in the film. Well, after Billy, that is. And Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker and Kathy Najimy are absolutely fantastic in the roles. So yeah, this film gets a thorough pass from me. Despite its flaws, I can still enjoy it. Because, as I like to say, no movie is perfect. But for the next video, we'll be moving away from Disney and getting back to some horror. So, until then, see you next time.